Hi, my name is Matt Holliday, and welcome back to my class on Programming in Go. So, for the next few sections, what I want to do is talk about concurrency in Go. But before I start that, I want to just start with defining concurrency and explaining the difference between concurrency and parallelism, and then talking about some of the problems we get into with concurrency. So, what I have on the slide in front of me are some possible definitions of concurrency. Right? When I started this, I was like, well, how do you define this? And how do you define it without going in a circle? So here are some things. And you know, we have the notion of execution in some non-deterministic order. I'll explain that. Or out-of-order execution, or non-sequential. And of course, the problem is I don't want to get into the well, concurrency is non-sequential. What is sequential? Well, that's not concurrent, because that's a circle. I can't get out of that. Right? And partial order. And there's a bunch of terms here which I want to briefly describe and then put them together into a working definition. So the first thing I want to deal with is partial order. right? And a partial order is different from a total order. Now, if you're accustomed to integers, right? You know, let's just start with unsigned integers. There's a total order, because there's an order between any two integers. 2 is less than 3, 2 is less than 5, 3 is less than 7, and so on. In a partial order, some things aren't ordered and some are. And so if I look at this little chart, 1 has to come before any part of 2 or 3, 4 has to happen after all of 2 or 3, or maybe all of 2 and 3. But I've drawn this red line down the middle because there's no relationship between, say, 2a and 3a, or 2a and 3b. And that's what I mean by partial order. Now, non-deterministic simply says that some of these orders can happen kind of randomly. Right? And so it does not necessarily mean wrong, and it doesn't even mean that you can tell a difference from the outside of the program. In other words, I can run the program, and it can have some non-determinism and still produce the right answer. But the states it takes internally might be in different orders. And so I've taken the diagram from the last slide. Let's go back to it real quick. I've taken that diagram and written down some of the possible orders. Right? Now notice 1 always comes first, and 4 always comes last. But the parts of 2 and 3, again, didn't have any order between them. And so I've got at least five orders here that are all acceptable orders. And the program might take one of those different orders, depending on just the vagaries of how it executes on real hardware. Now, I want to talk about execute independently for a second. Um, it, back in the old days, we didn't call things functions. We had functions and procedures. But before that, they were called subroutines. Right? I have my main program, it calls some subroutine, returns, calls some other subroutine, returns. And so the notion of a subroutine is it's a subordinate part of your main program. And if your main program is running, then the subroutine isn't. And when you jump into the subroutine, it runs until you go back to the main program. Right? Somewhere along the way, we got the notion of coroutines. And my cute phrase here is that coroutines are co-equal. Right? You start a coroutine, and it kind of runs alongside your main program. Now, that doesn't mean it's running at the same time. Okay? It was possible to run coroutines on old processors that just had one CPU, one core. So I want to put these parts together, and I know I've gone through that kind of quick. But I, I think I have a workable definition of concurrency in this phrase where I say parts of the program okay, may execute independently in some non-deterministic, possibly partial order. And what that means is that we don't necessarily have a complete control over exactly how all the parts work. And there is potential, depending on the hardware, that some of these things could actually even run at the same time, which would be in parallel. Great. So how does that differ from actual parallelism? Because in parallelism, parts of the program actually do run at the same time. Now, that only works if I have multiple CPUs or multiple cores in a CPU, right? Because otherwise, I was stuck with one. Now, concurrency mattered in the one-core world because, and the classic example would be, interrupts in an operating system. And in fact, when I was younger, pretty much concurrency was a, a part of an operating systems class, and that was the only pl place anybody really cared about it. Regular programmers didn't normally deal with concurrency that much unless you were one of those special real-time programmers doing like radar systems and, and so on. But now we've gotten into this world where we need concurrency in order to enable parallelism. 
and that's the order of things. You have to have a concurrent program because concurrency is really an aspect of how the software is put together, and parallelism is something that happens to you at runtime when you have a concurrent program that can actually run across multiple cores and be scheduled across those multiple cores. I want to make the point, concurrency doesn't necessarily make your program faster. In fact, if I write a very concurrent program and run it on a processor with just one core, it may actually run slower. Okay. What is going to make your program run faster is actually having parallelism, the ability to run multiple cores. Now, there is a case where concurrency can make you faster, and that's where, in fact, you have to stop for some external thing. I have some software that starts a socket, and you know I have to wait for another server to respond, and while I'm waiting for that server to respond, maybe I could be doing something else. And in that case, I can get speed ups even on a one-core machine. So there's an idea that concurrency is about dealing with things that could happen out of order, whereas parallelism is actually things happening at the same time. So in order to get the speed up of parallelism, we need concurrency, but concurrency brings problems with it. Okay, so like I say at the bottom of the slide, well, that's where the fun begins. I've taken this definition of a race condition from Wikipedia. I modified theirs. Now, a race condition is something that can actually even happen in hardware. It's not purely about software. So I took the Wikipedia definition and played with it a little bit to make it reflect software and to make it reflect the definition of concurrency that I'm using in these slides. So what is a race condition? Well, it's the possibility that my out-of-order non-deterministic execution may get something wrong. Okay, that one of the possible choices will lead me down a path where I actually, the program produces a wrong output. And I say may, because it's non-deterministic. You can call it random. In other words, if I have a race condition in my program, sometimes it may produce the right answer by accident, and sometimes I get unlucky and it produces the wrong answer. So the first thing I'm going to say is a race condition is a bug. Even if sometimes your program gets lucky and runs correctly, the fact that you've got a program that can randomly produce wrong answers, a race condition is a bug. But I want to drill down for just a second, right? Because of what I want to show is, going back to my diagram of the partial order, and I said here are some possible orders, right? Where, you know, one happens first and four happens last, but the parts of two and three didn't have an order. What happens if I say, hey, you know what? Two and three can't interleave. It's okay to do all of two first. It's okay to do all of three first. But you can't do 2a, then 3a, then 2b, then 3b. That's going to cause a problem, right? And so that's a case of a race condition because some of these orders are okay and some of them I've driven a line through it, right? I put a line through some of these to make it very clear those are cases where the order is going to cause a problem, right? So what do we do about a race condition? But before I get to that, I want to drill down one more level and kind of explain it in a more concrete way. Right? We're going to make deposits to a bank account. And of course, real banks have big computers, and big computers can do lots of things at the same time. So let's suppose that you and somebody else who's on your bank account, you both go to make deposits. And the mental model we have, of course, is that, well, you make a deposit, some money gets added to your account. Okay? No matter at what level you look at this, whether you look at this at the level of the ATM or the code or even what happens in the computer hardware, okay? That process is going to be a read, modify, write cycle. We've got to go and get the balance out of the account and then add to it and then put it back, right? We've got to read the balance. Even if it's in memory, we've got to read it from memory into a register in the CPU to do the arithmetic and write it back out, right? But our mental model of that is, well, just, it's just one thing. It just happens. You know, it's like our mental model if I write some code with the plus plus operator, right, I write A plus plus, and we think, yeah, well, A just magically becomes one greater. Well, that's not real. In real computer hardware, that also is read, modify, write. You've got to read the value of A, add one to it, and write it back. Great. What's the problem? Well, what happens if we're allowing these things to execute independently and out of order, and the, these things spread out a little bit? And so here's my example, right? I read a balance B. And then the other side reads a balance B. And then we say add 50 to it. And then we add 100 over here. And then we write B plus 50. And then the last thing we do is we write B plus 100, right? 
and $50 just evaporated. Now, you know what? The bank may be perfectly happy if they can get away with keeping it, but you're likely to go to the bank and say, what gives? I have two receipts for deposits. My bank account only went up by $100. Okay, this is a problem. So how do we fix that? And the answer is, this notion we have that read, modify, write has to happen as a unit, we have to enforce it. And so I've redrawn this picture on these little blue boxes here, you know, but what I really need to do is find some clip art and draw on here something that looks like a clamp, right? What we really want to do is we want to put a clamp around these three parts so they're stuck together. They can't be separated. Nothing else can come in between, right? So then we do, you know, B plus 50, and whatever that writes is the input to the next one. So that starts with B plus 50 and adds 100, and we get B plus 150 for sure. Okay? And the term for that is we want to make them atomic. We want to make this whole process of read, modify, write be an atomic operation, right? And the notion of an atom, going back to the Greeks, is it's not divisible. Okay? Obviously, in modern physics, we understand that atoms are divisible. But in terms of the use of the word atom here, okay, it's an indivisible thing. The read, modify, write cannot be spread apart. Nothing else can get in between. And so we know for sure that either one deposit happens first or the other deposit happens first. And whichever one happens second sees the results of the first one so that we actually get both the 50 and the 100 recorded and the bank account goes up by 150 bucks. Okay, that is the key idea of what a race condition is and the key idea about how we solve it. So we get race conditions when parts of the program that are executing independently change shared things, okay? And so this starts suggesting some simple solutions. They don't work all the time. The first one would be, well, don't actually share anything. If you don't share anything, then you can't modify shared things. Another choice is to share them but make them read only. And that may work in some programs. There may be programs where we do you know, we look at a large data set and we're going to analyze it. So we read in the data and we extract some information from it, but we don't change it. And so maybe most of that data is read only. Well, okay, that's safe. All right? It's possible in some times to do things where you have, well, there's some shared data. Most everybody reads it. Only one part of the program writes it. Now, that's not as simple as it sounds. Okay? And there are cases where that's just not going to work without using some of the concurrency control techniques we're going to talk about later. And that leads us to the fourth thing, and this is the common problem, right? Well, we have to share things, and we have to be able to modify them, and so we just have to solve the problem, right? We have to create atomic operations somehow, okay? And I'm not going to yet show the solution to that. That's going to come up in these next sections. I just want to stop here and talk about, you know, the problem, and I want to point out one thing. You know, and it was true on the last slide, right? If you think about this picture as concurrency, we've limited the concurrency now by requiring this additional relationship between the parts of two and three. And that is the price we're going to pay for doing any kind of atomic operation, is it's actually going to reduce our concurrency a bit. Okay? And it's just a necessary cost. Ideally, we'd like our program to be all concurrent and all parallel. And in reality, there's parts of our program that are going to need to reduce that in order to make them work right. Now, I want to take this slide and put a, a drawing against it real quick. And I'm going to do this drawing on the fly. Right? So the first thing I want to think about is performance, right? Let's suppose I have a two-lane road. Some folks go north. Some folks go south. And they don't interfere with each other. So this is the case of, you know, like, sh don't share anything, or maybe the shared things are read-only. Okay, you know, we have a certain amount of independence here in terms of how the data works, and so there's no, no slowdown in the traffic, right? I could have a one-lane road and just say everybody goes the same direction. And again, I don't have a problem. The, the thing we get into is the case where, well, I had a two-lane road, and my bridge is out. And so what I have to do in the middle of here is I have to have a segment where I'm fixing the bridge and there's a one lane road. So I have traffic going both directions, but now what I have to do is I have to put a traffic signal 
right? And, you know, the one lane road, either it's only north or it's only south, or I get, you know, an accident in the middle. And the price of having those stoplights to control the traffic through the one lane road is, in fact, traffic backs up a bit. All right, I lose some of the performance, but what I gain is the safety. I don't have to run the risk of a head-on collision in the middle of a one-lane road. Okay, so that's my attempt to describe concurrency and parallelism and to explain race conditions and to start the discussion of, well, how do we solve the problem of race conditions?